uh, a control seminar of Ladis Ginskop. We have been uh, having these seminars um, with the collaboration of COPY, uh, the lab Ladis and Urgis uh, Ginskop. And today we have the great pleasure and honor to receive here Helen Duran. Um, I will make a brief introduction of Helen and then I will pass the word to Helen so that she can make her presentation. And only in the end of the presentation, we will have the comments and questions session, okay? So uh, I will make this brief uh, presentation. Sometimes I will have to click here to allow some people that are going in. So Helen is an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Science at Wayne State University. I think that Helen also works at the electrical engineering department, isn't it, Helen? Oh, well, I technically I have an adjunct assistant professor to point, appointment there, but I, I don't really do um, any teaching or anything in, in that department, so uh, it's more entitled. Okay. okay, Helen received her BS in chemical engineering from UCLA, and uh, she also worked as an engineer at the Aerojet, sorry, Aerojet rocket line for two and a half years. Then she earned her MS in chemical engineering from UCLA in 2014 and her PhD in chemical engineering from UCLA in 2017. And subsequently, she started working at Wayne State University. Um, she um, received the Air Force Office of Scientific Research Young Investigated, Investigator Award, and her work has also received support from the National Science Foundation. Um, so, uh, presently, she um, is uh, serving as the Next Generation Manufacturing Sessions Area Chair for the 20, uh, 2020 Annual Meeting of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. Her research interests are in the area of process control, uh, process system engineering, but with a focus on process uh, control. Helen, uh, uh, we have had the opportunity to have a, a bit of an interaction with Helen while Kyle was uh, making a, a, a sandwich a period at UCLA, and Helen uh, helped a lot uh, co supervising her work, his work there. And we published the work uh, uh, at uh, H Journal, so it was very nice to have this collaboration. And um, today she will present uh, a work. I will describe it very briefly because she will make her own presentation. But it's she describes her work as uh, rigorous yet broadly applicable optimization-based control method for nonlinear processes. And this, it is a work that is motivated by, by industrial trends that demand uh, economical improvement of processes and uh, aspects of security and safety, and also taking into account the equipments in the integration of RTO and the process control layers. So uh, she will present the theoretical approaches and also applications to chemical processes. So we, we are really looking forward to attend this presentation. Helen is a very nice, very kind. She, she has, has been very receptive. Thank you very much. And I will pass the word to Helen. Thank you, Helen. Thank you so much, Mauricio. It is such an honor to be here today. I'm going to see how to do this. Quick, my entire screen, one sec. I have to set up the... Okay, I think you can see my computer now. So, okay, yes. I believe, okay, excellent. Great, well, thank you so much once again. Really, it is truly an honor for me to get to present here today and especially to get to see so many great colleagues. Um, so I am, as was mentioned, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Materials Science at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. And I'll be presenting our work regarding optimization-based control of nonlinear processes and focusing on how fundamental advances can enable intelligent and cybersecure process operation. 
So as a brief introduction to process control, I know people here are process control engineers or process systems engineers, but the motivation for using it is because when we have a chemical plant, we have a variety of operating objectives. We want to maintain safety, we want to meet environmental regulations, meet our product specifications, and make a profit. And so in order to be able to do all of these things at once, we have to continuously monitor our process and then externally intervene if any of these goals is not being met. And process control gives us an automated way for doing this. Traditionally, feedback control loops in the process industries are formulated in the way that's shown here. That means that we have a variable that describes the condition of a process. So for example, temperatures, pressures, or species concentrations, which we call outputs. Those get measured by a sensor, and then the measured value is compared against the set point, which is the value that we'd like the output to take. Then the error between the set point and the measured value of the output goes to a controller, and the controller uses some mathematical algorithm to determine what value of the input to apply to the process in order to reduce the error. And so the big question of control design is what algorithm should that controller run? And so in the classical control designs, which are widely used in industry, the algorithm will be a proportional integral derivative or PID control law. And this is a very nice algorithm from a computational perspective. The input or control action U is an explicit function of the error E between the set point and the measured value of the output. And so this can be computed in a relatively straightforward fashion. Despite those benefits of the PID control law, there are a number of challenges with it. So for example, tuning this controller, meaning picking values for KC, tau i, and tau d, will typically employ a process model and even then can be challenging to really get great parameters. And also, the control law does not necessarily have the ability to account for all the complexities in process behavior in some of the ways that we would like. And so that has been a big motivator for trying to move beyond the classical control designs into more advanced ones and particularly into model-based controllers. And these use a process dynamic model explicitly in the control design, where the model comes either from first principles modeling or can be identified from input-output process data. And the resulting model will then describe the process dynamics, meaning how the process states vary over time due to disturbances, inputs, and interactions between variables. And controllers will then be synthesized based on the process model. Typically, chemical processes are nonlinear. And so a lot of the um, a lot of the time and all the time with my work, we look at nonlinear model based control. And so just as an example of how nonlinearities come in super quickly for chemical processes, if all we have is just a CSTR, a non isothermal CSTR with an Arrhenius rate law and then also the um, first order rate law, then we can very quickly get a nonlinear system of ordinary differential equations that describes this CSTR. And in general, many chemical processes will have different process models, but a lot of them will be nonlinear due to effects like this. And so in order to be able to develop control laws which are general, I'm going to introduce some notation that will help us just talk generally about classes of nonlinear ordinary differential equations. So here, x is the vector of the process state, which for this CSTR example could be something like the temperature of the CSTR and the concentration of a reactant. x dot or dx dt is the time derivative of the states. u is a vector of inputs. So for this example, that might be something like a heat rate to the process. And w is a vector of disturbances. So for this example, that might be something like a time varying value of the inlet reactant concentration. And so with that, I will now be using this notation to signify a class of nonlinear systems described by nonlinear ordinary differential equations, where the time derivative of the states is equal to a nonlinear vector function of our states, inputs, and disturbances. And there are many different control laws which are able to drive the state of such a nonlinear system to the origin. And the type of control law that I work with is called model predictive control. And before I get into some more of the details about model predictive controller MPC, I'll first make a few more assumptions on our class of systems. We assume that the state, the input, and the disturbance are all bounded. We also assume that the system is stabilizable in the sense that there exists an explicit nonlinear feedback control law written as H of X in this talk that is able to render the origin or steady state asymptotically stable. And asymptotic stability can be defined by using a Lyapunov function V 
for which it is negative along the closed loop state trajectories under the controller H of X in the absence of disturbances for all X in a neighborhood D of the origin. And typically we use quadratic Lyapunov functions to try to do this type of stability analysis. And here I'll introduce an important notation for the remainder of this talk, which is this region omega rho. So this is a level set of the Lyapunov function in the region where the time derivative of the Lyapunov function is negative under H of X. And here we show that concept of the controller H of X driving the system to a neighborhood of the origin from any point within this stability region. So the controller H of X possesses a degree of robustness to disturbances and uncertainty, meaning that even in the presence of disturbances and uncertainty, it's able to drive the process state to a neighborhood of the steady state, but it does not explicitly account for performance and constraints. And so because of that, a different control design known as model predictive control has been developed that is able to account for performance as well as constraints. This is an optimization based controller, so it gets the control actions by computing an optimal solution. Typically in industry, we have that the objective function of MPC is quadratic. So this would be a form like AX squared plus BU squared if you were to have a single state and a single input. And the optimization problem of the MPC is solved every delta time units where delta is the sampling period. So we say that it's solved at every sampling time TK. And the resulting solution is a piecewise constant input trajectory with n pieces, where I'll call n the prediction horizon. And each piece is held constant for a period delta. So here, this red trajectory represents that. We see that from tk to tk plus 1, which is the length of a sampling period, the input is being held constant and then is allowed to be adjusted. When we actually solve our MPC optimization problem, we are talking about finding the values of the inputs that make our objective function here as small as possible, given that the predictions x tilde of our state vector have to be obtained from solving our nonlinear dynamic model subject to an initial condition obtained from a state measurement, and then our input and our state constraints also have to be satisfied. And so to do this, typically we use a nonlinear programming algorithm and one of the important issues for MPC is the question of feasibility of this controller, meaning whether or not there exists any input that can cause all of these constraints to be satisfied at once. And so the MPC has to be designed and the initial condition has to be chosen such that there are control actions that can cause all of these constraints to be met. Even though we calculate all n pieces of the input trajectory, we only apply the first one. And the reason for this is that it allows us to account for the effects of disturbances in plant model mismatch by getting feedback of the process state at the next sampling time and then resolving for a new input trajectory. But even though we're only going to apply the first sampling period's input, it still can be beneficial to calculate all of the end pieces of the prediction horizon and even to have longer prediction horizons because that can improve closed loop performance in the sense of driving the state to the steady state. And that's because the smallest possible value of this objective function occurs if x tilde is zero and u is zero, which happens at the steady state. So a well-designed MPC should drive the state to the steady state or origin. But this formulation of MPC does not guarantee on its own that we drive the state to the steady state or origin, which I'll call closed loop stability in some sense. And so a variety of approaches for being able to guarantee that the closed loop state is driven to the steady state or origin have been developed by modifying this formulation. And so that's the background that I'll give on model predictive control for moving into the major aspects of my talk, which is about some advances that we've been working on in model predictive control in order to be able to achieve new things for industry in general. And so um, I'll almost move into those advances, but the brief note on how is MPC used today in industry is here. So first, it's usually part of a hierarchical approach to optimization and control, where at the upper layer, we solve an, economics, um, an economically optimal steady state problem. And then we communicate that steady state to a model predictive controller that has the quadratic objective function that then is formulated with respect to the steady state that it received. And it computes control actions that should drive the state to the economically optimal steady state. And so even though this has been successful in industry, as there are increasing pushes toward next generation, smart market driven manufacturing, we need to consider ways of trying to integrate economics and control better than what we can get by taking this hierarchical approach. And so that was a major motivation for what's known as economic model predictive control or EMPC. 
And this is a model predictive controller, but instead of using a tracking objective function, it replaces that with a general stage cost. And what that means is that now that stage cost can actually be explicitly representative of the process economics. So you can have this controller computing economically optimal control actions at every sampling time. But one of the big changes that this brings is that potentially it doesn't operate a process at steady state anymore. It might operate it in a dynamic or a time varying fashion. So some potential use cases of this could be in cases where you might have a time varying objective that you want to minimize or a time varying constraint. And so because this control formulation can operate processes in a different way than has been traditional, it brought up a lot of theoretical considerations that have been being addressed over the last decade or so. And these are related to um, how to make a control formulation that's based on economics be stable and also feasible. And so as a brief introduction to EMPC and what does that kind of formulation look like, it looks a lot like the traditional model predictive control formulation, except that we do have an economics based objective function. It again uses a dynamic model, still a state feedback measurement, still input and state magnitude constraints. But one other thing that you might want to consider for this is input rate of change constraints. So what these would do is that if the controller is really aggressive in the way that it tries to search for optimal profits so that it's computing very aggressive control actions for the actuators, you could add some type of constraint like this to try to prevent it from doing that kind of thing. And so with that, we've been looking a lot in our work at economic model predictive control and how we can harness it for different types of things that we want to achieve. So one of those is essentially making controllers more autonomous, also looking at what are the implications of using that type of control law when there could be cyber attacks on a control system. And then finally looking at what are the interactions between advanced controllers like that and some of the design and equipment considerations. And so I'll begin by talking about some of the work that we've been doing more at the autonomy and um, EMPC interface. We consider that we would really like controllers to be intelligent and to be able to have some level of sort of self-design. And so what I mean by that is we'd like them to be able to handle anomalies themselves. We'd like them to have some way of developing good models online that seem to be representative of the process physics. And we'd also like to have them be a little interpretable and to respond to what an end user might say about them. And so I'll begin talking about those different aspects and how we've been trying to handle those or, or making first directions in those in different ways. So with regard to anomaly handling, we can consider that an anomaly occurs when the process dynamics change. So there's a formulation of economic model predictive control known as Lyapunov based economic model predictive control or EMPC or LEMPC, I should say, sorry. Um, and what LEMPC is, is it was really pioneered a lot by my PhD advisor. And so I did a lot of work with this during my PhD in different aspects of it. But it's a control formulation that's actually able to guarantee that the closed loop state is maintained within a bounded region of state space, even when you have disturbances and um, plant model mismatch. And so what I'll do is I'll first describe this formulation of EMPC, and then I'll talk about some of the ways that we've been extending it in order to be able to handle some of these questions like anomalies. So the basic formulation of LEMPC is written here, and it looks a lot like the standard EMPC formulation. The major differences are that we've changed the way the input rate of change constraints are enforced slightly for feasibility reasons. And then also we have here this red, um, the up and up based stability constraint. And so what this constraint does is it requires that the predictions of the state have to be maintained within this subset omega rho E of that stability region omega rho. And as the reminder of what's the stability region, it's characterized by a region where an explicit stabilizing controller is negative and it's a level set of the Lyapunov function. And so by designing this conservative region, omega rho E, and maintaining the state predictions in that, we can actually guarantee that the actual closed loop state is maintained within this larger region omega rho at all times under sufficient conditions. And so that's the provable stability result for this controller. We can actually guarantee feasibility as well in that there always exists a solution to this problem and that that solution is actually the explicit stabilizing controller H of X. We also have another result for this, which is that the input rate of change constraint design here does actually ensure that the difference between two control actions applied to the process is less than an upper bound as long as you have this epsilon r in this formulation and also your sampling period sufficiently small. 
So these closed loop stability, feasibility, and input rate of change results hold even in the presence of disturbances due to the properties of the Lyapunov based controller and the constraint design. We have a second mode of operation of this Lyapunov based EMPC. And what this one does is it drives the closed loop state to a neighborhood of the steady state or the origin by using this constraint shown here in blue, which I'll call a contractive constraint because it contracts or decreases the Lyapunov function. And so the provable stability result when we operate with this mode of LEMPC is that the closed loop state does go to the neighborhood of the origin and we again get the guaranteed feasibility. And so there are a number of things that you can do to try to make this design, um, to enhance this design. Something that we've looked at, for example, is how can we make there be greater flexibility in the characterization of this region omega rho E by having our measurements that we take more frequent than the sampling period. And so there are a lot of ways that you can enhance this formulation. And so one way that we have looked at for enhancing that formulation is for this anomaly handling problem. So specifically, we consider that changes may occur in the underlying process dynamics, which we assume occur at some times. Now, we don't know these times in advance, but we assume that we can, in some sense, predict what is a worst case that might happen if there's a change from where we're at right now. And then we're going to assume in this case, because these are anomalies, that we don't really actually know the process dynamics at any given time. That at best, we just have an empirical model that we've gathered from data that describes what our best description is of those dynamics at a given time. And so we assume that our empirical model, which is represented by this equation, is also stabilizable. So we can develop a control law, HNL, which could render the origin of this empirical model asymptotically stable in a Lyapunov sense. And so now when we have changing dynamics, we may want to change our empirical model. So here we parameterize those changes in the empirical model by Q. So this is the LEMPC that's here for handling the um, changing dynamics. So we have an economics-based objective function, and then we have our empirical model, but at any given time, depending on whether or not we've re-identified a new model due to sensing a change in the dynamics, we'll have some empirical model parameterized by Q. We'll have state and input constraints, and then our Lyapunov-based stability constraints. And so because these are related to a Lyapunov function developed for the Qth empirical model, we do have our Lyapunov function as well as our stability region and our Lyapunov-based controller also parameterized by Q here. But so this is basically LEMPC but with the empirical model. So then when we have our system in the, um, in the case that the dynamics have not changed, then we want to be able to originally design some region, which here is this region outlined in blue that's called omega rho hat q here. And what this region is, is it's a region where if we have no change in the dynamics, we should not leave this region. And we consider that this region here is within a larger region, which we'll denote by omega rho safe. And that gives us a little bit of buffer room here in case we do have a change in the dynamics that we won't immediately leave a region that we've characterized. So we operate the process within this region omega rho q until we sense that the closed loop state has left that region. And then we say, okay, that must mean there was a change in the dynamics. So then we activate a backup controller that we can use for a number of sampling periods before we exit this region omega rho q safe. And then that allows us to have some time to collect some data to re-identify the model. And then before we leave Omega Rho Q safe, we re-identify our model with that new data. And then we implement a new controller based on the new empirical model to drive the closed loop state to lower level sets of our new Lyapunov function. And then we can start up a new LEMPC with respect to the new empirical model once we are close enough to the origin and we're happy with the new region we have. And so this does guarantee that the state will remain under, in Omega Rho Q under normal operation. As the plant model mismatch increases, the state will leave omega rho q but not omega rho safe. And then when we update our model, we can return it back to a different level set that we would like to operate in after that point. And so this is this is helpful at allowing us to see some of the guarantees that would need to be made or, or better understand what are the conditions under which we would be able to handle these changes in the dynamics over time, even with a data-driven model. And so this will take a good deal more work on our side to characterize a lot of the things that we want to look at with regard to verification and how do you understand um, some of the future of this direction. But one thing that this does is it does give us some theoretical conditions that if they could be looked at over time at runtime, we could be able to guarantee safety over time.
And so another aspect of what we would like a controller to be able to do is to obtain a model online. And so an important question for how to obtain a model is that you want to get the right model structure. And so we can identify models based on system identification to get things that where we might need to actually guess the model structure a priori. But one question that we can use with LEMPC is how could the LEMPC be designed to help us in maybe determining the underlying model structure? And so we want to formulate an LEMPC that is able to help us get online operating data with a targeted structure for assessing what might be a reasonable form for the model in terms of its underlying structure. And so the idea with that would be we can use a normal LEMPC, but then at certain times we could activate some type of soft constraint that tries to drive us toward data that we've determined that we want to collect. And then we can use that to try to help us get some of the information that we would like online. And then finally, we can look at the concept of how could you add interpretability or responsiveness in control design. So in this case, if the controller was going to self-update itself to improve its response according to how an end user feels about the way that it's operating the process that would enhance the accessibility of advanced control and also potentially aid interpretability but it would require the self updates to be based on human reactions to the manner in which the controller is operating the process so there's uncertainty in discerning human preferences human preferences might not be very correct or very good and so the question would be how can we advance responsiveness of a controller without impacting the theoretical guarantees like close-up stability and recursive feasibility because we have all this uncertainty so one way of doing that would be looking at what are the constraints that we can have in such a controller that would not impact the stability constraints. So in LEMPC, it's the Lyapunov-based stability constraints that guarantee the closed-loop stability and feasibility results. As long as you add new constraints that remain feasible, then as long as they don't conflict with those prior ones, they might be able to adjust the way that the control operates the process, but they're not impacting stability. And so an example of constraints like that is those input rate of change constraints that were described on the prior slides. So actually these constraints, we can adjust this upper bound however we would like. It can be zero or it can be something greater than zero, but it doesn't impact whether or not we gain closed loop stability because these constraints have been designed to always have a feasible solution regardless of what the upper bound is here. So this implies that this might be a type of constraint that we could tune in response to something like human sentiments. Maybe we want to rank how the process, um, how end users feel the process behaves for various values of epsilon desired to help the controller sort of tune its own constraint set. So as an example of what that would look like, here we have an application to a chemical process example. There's catalytic oxidation of ethylene to ethylene oxide in a continuous stirred tank reactor. We have our dimensionless inputs here, which are the feed volumetric flow rate and the feed ethylene concentration into the CSTR. And we also have four process state variables that are dimensionless here, which correspond to the reactor gas density in the reactor, the ethylene concentration, the ethylene oxide concentration, and the reactor temperature. And here's the reactor dynamic model consisting of four nonlinear ordinary differential equations derived from mass and energy balances. And our control objective is going to be to maximize the average yield of ethylene oxide, where the yield is given by this equation shown here. So the, there's a limit in this example on the average amount of ethylene that we can feed to the reactor. So this is a, a feedstock limitation that we impose, and that fixes the denominator of this yield expression. And so that causes us to want to maximize our numerator to maximize the yield. And so that's what we do. And we also have bounded inputs for physical reasons. And we're going to enforce some input rate of change constraints in our EMPC. This one doesn't actually use the Epinot based stability constraints. So these constraints are just directly enforced on the input changes themselves rather than with respect to the Lyapunov based controller as in the theoretical results. But when we impose these um, different upper bounds on these input rate of change constraints, we get different input trajectories. So here in this legend is the different upper bounds that we used on the input rate of change. And then we can see all the different input trajectories that got computed. And here's the way that the different state trajectories look for all of those different upper bounds. In each case, the closed loop state is maintained in a bounded region of operation. So we say that closed loop stability is maintained. And then we could assume that people go through and they rank how they feel about all those responses to finish out this idea of how would that relate to constraint design. And if we assume people, for example, ranked their values of epsilon desired like this, then we could say, okay, here's the maximum 
sort of ranking. So I'm going to use the epsilon desired that's right here and then operate the process like that. So that's an example of how you could think about this sort of human machine interaction coming in without impacting closed loop stability. And so now I'll move on to some work that we've done in trying to move EMPC into the cybersecurity domain and looking at this from a more theoretical perspective and what would it take to make a cyber attack resilient controller. And so cyber attacks on control systems seek to impact a physical process and they can impact safety. Cyber attacks on feedback controllers are problematic because they remove associations between state measurements and inputs. So any input in the input bounds could potentially be applied at any given state under a cyber attack. And that really defies our standard notions of feedback control. So that's why this is a problem. So in our work so far related to cyber attacks, we focused on a specific type of cyber attack, which is a false sensor measurement cyber attack. And so in this case, the control loop would be broken where the measurement from the sensor is not received by the controller. Instead, it's getting some false sensor measurement. And so we can ask, what would it take for a system, a control system to be cyber attack resilient when we have false sensor measurements like this? So from a theoretical perspective, it would mean that there can be no possible input policies given the controllers used and their implementation strategies, such that the state is not in the set of allowable states anymore for any allowable initial condition and for any disturbances in the input bounds at any time. And so our goal would be to say, is it possible to design a control law and its implementation strategy that independent of the specific trajectory of the falsified state measurements is able to prevent the state from ever leaving the safe region at any time and for any inputs in the input bounds. And so that definition of cyber attack resilience is really non-constructive in trying to help us address that problem. So what we're going to do to have a deeper understanding of what it would take for a controller to be cyber attack resilient is we are going to look at two different um, ideas for cyber attack resilient controllers and understand what works or doesn't work for each one with respect to cyber attack resilience and why. So the two things that we're going to start by looking at, one is a controller implementation where we'll incorporate randomness. The idea is, oh, maybe we can fool the attacker so that they don't know what controller we're going to take. Does that lead to cyber attack resilience? And the second case is going to be looking at integrating feedback control and open loop control. So the conclusions that you'll see from these examples are that just doing something random is not going to be cyber attack resilient, despite that it sounds like, oh, maybe I would be able to fool that attacker, hoping that the attacker lacks knowledge about the control design is not sufficient for actually meeting the definition of cyber attack resilience. And so in terms of what would it look like to even incorporate randomness in a control law? So the concept here is that an attack might be designed by reverse engineering known control law, which suggests that maybe if you're able to randomly select the controller to be used at a given sampling time, that might make the cyber attack design more difficult. So we can only really though use randomness to try to fend off these attacks if when there is no attack, we can guarantee closed loop stability. And so we did actually develop an implementation strategy for LEMPC where we could guarantee closed loop stability under some type of randomized implementation policy. So specifically, we developed a number of different LEMPCs and also a Lyapunov based controller then at each sampling time, we randomly select one of the controllers until one is found for which the state measurement is within the stability region for that controller. And then we also had sort of a baseline stability region that included the stability regions of all of these extra controllers. And that meant that in a worst case, we would just default to H of X if some of these extra controllers didn't have the state measurement in their stability regions. So this actually allows us to guarantee we could maintain close-up stability and feasibility at all times under normal operation. It turns out that this formulation, though, doesn't guarantee cyber attack resiliency. And so we can show why through a chemical process example. So in this case, we're going to operate a continuous stirred tank reactor once again, but this time it's one where there's a second order exothermic irreversible reaction of the form A to B. And that's shown here. Our control objective is to regulate the process in an economically optimal time varying fashion while we maintain closed loop stability. Our economics based objective function in this case is based on the production rate of our desired product. And we consider the manipulated input constraints here for physical reasons. We develop our Lyapunov based controller using the input corresponding to our inlet concentration equal to its steady state value and then our heat rate input determined via Sontag's control law. We develop a um, quadratic Lyapunov function 
and then we get our stability region. And this is our base case stability region. In addition to this one, we also develop um, a number of other LEMPCs. So there's seven LEMPCs in total, and all of them have stability regions within the one that was just described. And so um, we also have our backup Lyapunov-based controller. And here's what happens when there's no attack and we're simulating the process with the randomized implementation strategy, we see that even with the randomization, the closed loop state is always within this outer blue stability region, omega row one, over the time of operation. And then now we'll see what happens when we add the cyber attacks in. So we're going to have a constant false sensor measurement here, and we're going to compare the cases. What if we add a single LEMPC at all times? So there's no randomization. And then what if we have the randomized LEMPC implementation strategy? And the randomized LEMPC results do depend on what seed we give to our random number generator, but I'll come back to that in just a second. So the randomized LEMPC here is this black trajectory, and the case that we have the single LEMPC is this red one. So what we can see is there's really not much benefit. This is a this is an upper bound on the temperature that we wanted to set. This is outside the stability region, so the state should never even go here at all if there's no attacks. But what we see here is the time that it takes for the state to go above, or for the temperature to go above this 55 Kelvin deviation variable is not that much different when we have the single LEMPC versus the randomized LEMPC. So effectively, there wasn't that much help here in randomizing. And even if we were to look at different seeds to the random number generator, this is the amount of time it takes for the deviation variable for the temperature to exceed the 55 Kelvin. What you can see here is that um, there's not much difference in all these times. It's pretty short before it's out. So what that means is that the proposed randomized LEMPC implementation strategy could not guarantee that no problematic inputs could be applied over time. The cyber attacks can succeed here even if the LEMPC objective functions are quadratic. And so just fundamentally, the randomization is not cyber attack resilient. It doesn't make a guarantee that there is no problematic control action that could be computed. It's just hoping essentially on the attacker not being able to figure something out, which doesn't make it resilient. So one way of actually getting resilience would be to um, have a process with an open loop stable steady state and then apply the open loop stable steady state input, because now you don't need any feedback at all to know that that input's going to drive your state to the origin. But the problem is that this loses every benefit of feedback control. And so this indicates some of the great challenges with trying to operate a system in a resilient way against attacks. And it suggests that we need something stronger than just the control law. And so some of the things that we've looked at, we've looked at how might process design play a role in this? How would different designs maybe have different worst case results that may or may not be as problematic as other ones, and then also integrating control and detection. And so this has been playing a role in some of the work that we've been focusing on recently. We've been looking at three different detection concepts that are very highly tied to the theory of the controllers that they're being integrated with. And then we've looked at how do these stack up in terms of guaranteeing resilience. So. The first one that I'll talk about is detection concept one. In this case, the potential cyber attack detection mechanism is based on the closed loop stability properties of LEMPC. So specifically, if our closed loop state is in some set, for example, of the region omega rho E1, and we develop some new steady state and new stability region for that steady state that contains our current state measurement, then we can use that new LEMPC to drive the state to a neighborhood of the origin by activating the contractive constraint. That's part of what we guarantee with Lyapunov stability theory. So what that means is that maybe we could use this to randomly probe for cyber attacks. So for example, at a given time, we might have the closed loop state in this region, omega row two, and we're using our original LEMPC design. Then when we're at that time that we wanna probe for the cyber attack, we generate this new stability region, and then we activate our contractive constraint. And then over the next sampling period, we evaluate the value of the Lyapunov function. So if there's no cyber attack, then our new Lyapunov function must decrease according to the stability proofs over a sampling period for the LEMPC developed with respect to the new steady state. If it does not, you could say, wait a minute, that wasn't supposed to happen. It was guaranteed to decrease. This might be a potential sensor measurement attack. And so this could help detect an attack potentially, but there are a lot of challenges with this. It's really based on sort of luck that you probe at the right time 
in many ways too you could say well maybe the attacker actually gets really lucky themselves and it happens that whatever state measurement trajectory they're giving you decreases the Lyapunov function for this new controller and so this one only really guarantees that if something is out of line it will detect it if it's out of line in the measurements but it doesn't guarantee that the measurements are going to be out of line so then we also looked at a second detection concept so in this one the concept was what happens if we design our stability region a little more conservatively, and we start looking at the difference between our state measurements and our state predictions. And we can actually bound the difference between the state measurement and what the worst case should be, how far off the state prediction could go in the case that we have no attack. And so in that case, our state prediction is based on the last state measurement via the nominal model. And then we'll flag a sensor measurement as false if the difference between the state measurement and the prediction is greater than a certain threshold. And then we can make our stability region conservative enough that even if the measurement is false, but it was sort of flying under the radar there, it's less than the detection bound, then that we can still guarantee that the state for the next sampling period is maintained within the stability region. So this one is a little stronger than the prior detection concept that was doing the probing, but this still has the disadvantage in that even though it can for sure detect anything that goes above the upper bound on the state predictions, and it does guarantee that if you have a false measurement that's not detected, you get a sampling period within the stability region, it doesn't guarantee anything beyond that. And the reason for that is that this whole method is based on the state predictions. And so as soon as your state measurement becomes falsified, your next prediction is now off and you can't guarantee anything about that anymore. So then we had a third detection concept that we integrated with our controllers. This one was the case of having a state estimator instead of a prediction. And so in this case, we need multiple redundant state estimators. And the idea is that the estimates should actually be close to one another when there's not an attack. And in that case, if we find there's a deviation of the estimates, it suggests that there might have been a sensor measurement attack. And in this case, if we're controlling our process with an MPC that uses one of the state estimates, we can actually guarantee that as long as no more than, as long as there's at least one estimate that has not been impacted by the attacks, the closed loop state is always maintained within the stability region, even if we didn't detect the attack. So that is three concepts for trying to use LEMPC to attempt to detect attacks. Those are all for cases where the process dynamics remain fixed. So that was the LEMPC with the random control on modifications to try to probe for the attacks, state feedback LEMPC with an attack detection strategy based on state predictions, and output feedback LEMPC with an attack detection strategy based on redundant state estimators. So in this case, both the predictions and the estimates are model-based. So now if we think back to one of the first things that we discussed, which was what happens if there are anomalies or changes in the dynamics, which is something we wanna be able to handle with an advanced controller. If the dynamics change, the models that are being used in these attack detection strategies become less accurate. And so what that means is that either a dynamics change or a cyber attack could cause the cyber attack threshold to be reached. And either a dynamics change or a cyber attack could cause the closed loop state measurement to leave the region omega rho Q, which was a region that we said we'd never want the state to leave if there's no dynamics change and no attack. And so in order to be able to handle the dynamics changes, we have to modify our detection strategies to have two stages. So here's the same concept that we looked at earlier where we're going to go back to the case the dynamics might change. We operate the process in a subset omega rho Q of this larger region, omega rho safe Q. This region omega rho safe Q is our operating region where we want to ensure that the state never leaves this one. But when it leaves this region omega rho Q, we say something weird is happening and we start to prepare to re-identify a model. That's where we were at earlier. Now we're going to modify that strategy slightly for a similar case, but in the case where we also might have a cyber attack on the sensor measurements. So if the closed loop state leaves omega rho Q when we also could have a cyber attack, or if an initial detection threshold is exceeded, then we say, okay, that could have been due either to the model actually changed or there's a cyber attack. So we're going to reset our detection threshold and prepare to re-identify the model. And so this is a way of handling some of the ambiguity in whether the first threshold breach is due to an attack or a model change. And so in the state prediction case, we can actually guarantee that the closed loop state stays within omega rho safe Q for at least one sampling period for either an undetected attack or a model change. 
And in the state estimate case, we can have sufficient conditions to maintain the closed loop state within Omega Rho safe queue for all times for an undetected attacker and model change. And so with that, I'll now move on to some ways that we've looked at the interactions between advanced controllers and process designs. So there are a lot of ways that design and control can interact. Some of those interactions can impact safety and profitability. So we've looked at several different things. Some of those are equipment fidelity considerations. So for example, how do the control actions computed by some type of advanced control law, like an EMPC that's not necessarily operating a process at steady state, how might those impact the equipment that is being used to contain the process that the EMPC is controlling? We've also looked at interactions between process design and EMPC, and then also some of the worst case outcomes you could get under control system cyber attacks. So the, um, this was in many ways thinking about sort of a HAZOP type perspective on how would you include cyber attacks when you're thinking about how should I design my process? And so here's an example of um, how control and design can interact. And this could be related to either cybersecurity, um, or this can be related to cybersecurity. And so here we have a continuous stirred tank reactor followed by piping. Our pipe is insulated and rigidly fixed at one end with a bellows joint at the other. The bellows joint has some spring constant KS, and the fluid temperature at the pipe entrance is the temperature of the CSTR outlet flow. Our pipe mechanical design is shown here. And so in this case, we're going to use a model predictive controller in order to control the fluid that's coming out of the CSTR into that piping. And so we want to operate our process at steady state, and here's the control law. And then say that we provide a false sensor measurement to this controller at every sampling time. In that case, it can actually raise the temperature of the fluid exiting the CSTR quite significantly. And the value of the spring constant can impact the maximum temperature that the pipe is going to be able to withstand without possible yielding. So for example, if the spring constant is relatively high, then the yielding might occur at some temperature that's below the temperature that the state can go to in the event of this attack. But if the spring constant is much lower, then probably any attack that you're going to perform is not going to be able to cause the piping to yield. And so this indicates some of those interactions between the control design and the process design. And so um, we can have here accounting for the Material conditions also due to the cyber attacks via MPC in equipment in a more robust way using computational fluid dynamics and finite element analysis simulations. So this is some of the sort of preliminary results that we have in this direction. We've been looking at how can you take a computational fluid dynamic simulation that includes a controller where there's a cyber attack, and then that could impact, for example, the temperature on the outside of the steam methane reformer and raise it very significantly. Or, or at least it can raise it compared to its normal or intended operating condition. So if it raises it suddenly, then how would that impact things like the stresses and strains in the equipment? And then so you can hook up a simulation with computational fluid dynamics to a finite element analysis simulation to analyze the stresses and strains under a cyber attack and see is this going to hurt the equipment or what are the worst case conditions if the control system is attacked? And so in conclusion, the adoption of intelligent decision-making algorithms hinges on their usability, safety, and security. Optimization-based controllers are an example of a flexible automation framework that can be modified to handle these challenges. We've looked at moving toward self-design via anomaly handling, online model building, and interpretability or responsiveness, addressing cybersecurity concerns via detection and control combinations, and understanding interactions between process and material design and control to enable new design paradigms. Optimization-based control provides a framework for addressing these issues with closed loop stability and feasibility guarantees, and further fundamental advances are required to realize the vision of intelligent, safe, secure, and profitable control designs. For the work completed during my PhD studies, I would like to thank the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, and UCLA for financial support. And then at Wayne State, we are very grateful for financial support from the National Science Foundation, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and Wayne State University. I would like to acknowledge my great PhD students. Um, and Hiki Oyama is my most senior PhD student. He actually studied with um, Luis, who is here today. And so he's a great PhD student. He did a lot of the cybersecurity work that you saw um, presented with regard to the detection strategies. And then Kip Neiman, Keisha Frangen, 
and Dominic Mastina are my other PhD students. Laura Giuliani also worked in the group as an MS student and Matthew Wagner was an undergraduate. So thank you very much. I will, I guess, stop sharing that to, or I keep sharing at this point. I'll, I think I stopped sharing. So okay. um, yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Helen. Thank you very much. It was um, really, as you had uh, anticipated when you described it, the abstract of your presentation, very broad and applicable, many aspects that you discussed. It. I think that the audience will be interested in asking things and knowing better. So I will ask uh, the audience to um, address, uh, to use the chat so that I can know the order and then I will ask uh, you to make questions, okay? And um, I have already one person that had uh, said that has a question, is Professor Fabio. Um, Fabio, and then Professor Fabio is going to make his question and then I will prepare the list with the other ones. So Fabio, please, okay. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank you. Well, hi, Alan. Nice to meet you. It was a very nice presentation. It was very fast, actually. I think that I could, I may have lost something in information. And I maybe this question because of this information that I lost. So basically, there are two information. Well, one is basically how did you generate your empirical model? It was basically one kind of sparse identification and linear dynamic. And how is it? And how did you select this kind of uh, data-driven model and for your CFD simulation. It's very expensive, actually. So did you use the same data model, meta model for your data-driven experimental one data? So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Fabio, for the question. So with regard to the data-driven modeling, so a lot of what we were doing there was more on the theoretical side. So it was that if you have a data-driven model, which has some level of plant model mismatch, what are the guarantees that we could make? We didn't really go into simulations that had real system identification in them. The simulations that we did were had like relatively small, just like, oh, what if there gets to be an extra term on the right-hand side? Because we were more at the on the theoretical side with that so far. I think that that's oh. definitely an area of future research to try to look into actually like the integration with the data-driven modeling strategies more closely. Um, can you repeat the next question? I'm sorry. So uh, in CFD simulation, did you use some reduce your larger models just like uh, the Stephen Burton has been doing in, I think in no way in verse as well. Did we use the data-driven models? No, yeah, but for CFD to reduce the model, for instance, oh, for CFD. CFD. You can extract the data and kind of generate a DMD or POD strategy to drive the model, to derive the model. It's a great question. Yeah. So part of our goal with the so with the CFD and the FEA so far, we've only implemented a um, P controller to get. So it was just a P controller in there where there was a cyber attack on it. We're trying to move into having there be a model predictive controller or an even like an economic model predictive controller, but we're not there yet. So for that part to include such a controller in there, we do need to develop some type of data-driven model, but we haven't gotten that far yet. But yes, that will be a next step for us. Okay, thank you. That was my questions. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Fabio and, and Helen. Um, one um, graduate student that we have, Marcellus. Marcellus, it's not Caio, it's uh, Marcellus Geddes. Marcellus has, um, has asked me to read the question to you. He asked if you have investigated or what do you believe would be the main challenges regarding feasibility guarantees of using your intelligent feedback control designs to achieve a target state in batch self-assembly processes? Yeah, very interesting question. You mean like molecular self-assembly, I guess? Um, um, yes, I'm not quite sure. I'm not, I don't know if Marcellus can speak of if he has, yes, he has some problem with his microphone. Um, okay. Yes, yes, oh, yeah, like crystallization. crystallization. Yes. Oh, okay. It's actually really interesting you say that because the project that Mauricio mentioned at the beginning that I worked on with 
him and and um and others who are here and also Kayo was actually MPC for batch crystallization. So um, you can use MPC for batch crystallization um, in terms of, in the work that we did before, that was not theoretical. That was much more, um, it was much more practical style. Uh, in terms of feasibility, so um, feasibility is the question of whether or not the optimization problem has a solution. Um, so if it was to be, I guess the question would be about, so I think the question probably is because when we do our feasibility analysis right now with LEMPC, we do it and we say there's a steady state and I can guarantee that there's a controller that drives me to the steady state and then I use that one in the design of my EMPC and then therefore I guarantee um, feasibility because that controller exists that can drive me to the steady state. Now, if you have a batch process, you don't guarantee you drive yourself. I mean, you don't you don't have a steady state anymore. You're always time varying. So I'm trying to think how that would go. I think I I think off the top of my head, I'm hesitant to give a new theoretical result. I can say that what Kayo did in in his he like had made his prediction horizon as long as the um, the batch. So that then at each sampling time when he would reduce his prediction horizon in order to try to help with getting a solution at all the sampling times. But I know that that also is not guaranteed if you have plant model mismatch. So, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. I'd have to think about it more. Um, I'd like to add that uh, Marcellus is working with shape control uh, for crystallization, and he has also uh, working experimentally and also developing models and by simulation. And he spent some time with Professor Marta. That's why oh, we are wow. all well, all linked in a way. And, yeah, uh, I wow. Yes, very nice. And Ajimiro has one question, uh, so I will pass to him. Yes, uh, Marcel. Oh, Mauricio, uh, my internet here was very unstable today. I don't know why, but uh, I missed many parts of your presentation, Ellen. But uh, the, the part I saw, it was a great presentation. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I have a, a question about the stability region that you draw in your formulation. Mm -hmm. yeah, about those uh, uh, size of the stability region, uh, the, the, the rho uh, of omega and the omega rho, the size of rho. Uh, because uh, usually to, to determine this uh, correctly in the nonlinear system, you have to solve the Hamilton Jacob Isaacs inequality you know, to, to get the correct uh, stability region. Uh, so, uh, how, how you deal with this in your formulation? How you uh, turn in this uh, stability region in, in order to not, not be so conservative in your formulation? You have a very uh, robust and effective controller law. Okay, so do you have some thought about that? Yeah, these are good questions. So the way that we do, um, so a lot of times our, our simulations, we've been using a continuous stirred tank reactor that has two states for a lot of times when we have the, when we actually design the stability regions. In that case, because it becomes two dimensional, you can draw, um, you can just draw it essentially in MATLAB where one axis in, in state space, you can have like one axis be temperature, one axis be concentration. Then we choose a Lyapunov based controller and we check V dot at all the different points and where it's negative. Then we say like that can be included in the stability region and where it's positive, we say don't include that in there. That's been um, the way that we've been doing that um, for the simulation examples. I think that um, in terms of like how to get it mo more, um, robustly, I think is, is definitely an interesting direction for, for future research to try to get it for a larger scale process than one that you can do in 2D. Yeah, um, I, I mentioned mainly when you do the, the, the database modeling, that you do some uh, model adjustment during the, the dynamics, so, so the, the, the size will change also, and you have to be uh, careful with, uh, that you're not outside of the stability region. Once you don't have the, the, the real model or the more correct model of your system, Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, these are great questions. For for the stuff with the database models, we did focus a lot more on that from the theoretical perspective so far. I think taking it to look in more detail at the um, 
at exactly how that would work if we start doing it with the data-driven models, I think is, is maybe a topic for future research. We haven't actually done a lot of system identification in any way with those yet, primarily the theoretical stuff. Yeah, that's uh, very a lot of things to do at this subject. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's definitely is a great yeah. um, future research direction. I agree. Yeah, nice job you are doing. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Ajimiro and Helen. And now, Luis Claudio would like to to speak. Thank you, Mauricio. Uh, outstanding presentation, Helen. I loved. Can you hear me? I can hear yes. you. Okay, uh, outstanding. And uh, let me tell you, the first six months when I was at, at CLA, I faced this work with uh, Ajimiro told, and I developed and uh, still unpublished a design of a region that maximizes the stability region of a nonlinear system. So I'm still not uh, confident that it's finished. That's the reason that I still working on that. Uh, how you but, solve that? You solve the Hamilton Jacobi exact inequality? Or? It's numerically, but it, I, I maximize the region to uh, from the stability region. At the same time, I solve the equation, uh, the Hamilton equation. It's okay. uh, yeah. It's but cannot do. I cannot do that by online. So you have to do that previously because it takes so long. That's the yeah, problem. Yeah, that's the major problem for the uh, yeah. A dot I equation. Yeah. Yeah, that's and the other problem is the it's based on a model that is not correct. So it, it, you need to make sure that is is uh, representative enough. Representative enough. But my point here is I'm so happy to see you, Helen, and so uh, I mean so happy to see how big your group is right now. Your research group is. I'm very happy and uh, congratulations, outstanding talk. Very nice. Well, thank, thank you so you. much. Yes, it's it's really amazing because you have been uh, at Wayne for su such a short time, three years, you said, and you have already such a large group. So congratulations. Uh, I also was really she impressed. Works, she is bright and she, she works a lot. She <laughs> works a fun. lot. She. She gets really involved with it. yes, I see. Uh, Helen, I, I, I would like to ask the audience to feel free and make more comments and questions. Uh, uh, we are here and uh, you see to, to listen to you. As, as I said to Helen, we have uh, students that are undergraduate and so many oh, wow. concepts. Yes, many concepts were new. Maybe they understood the beginning, but then uh, in the continuation, they may get lost, a bit lost. Um, it's interesting because I, I, I had one question that is more general. You see, uh, tonight we will have a, a meeting now uh, working remotely. We have meetings at any time. So we will have a meeting that we, we will discuss um, how uh, we are going to you see, change the disciplines for the graduate students in the area oh. of PSE. Oh, and wow. Yeah. So we will be free to present different, uh, you see, um, disciplines or the contents of disciplines. Uh, what contents do you think would be interesting to be present in the um, uh, discipline of process control or process optimization for graduate students of chemical engineering, you see? as uh, a course that they could uh, choose in like in a strict way. It would not be, they would not have to do it, but it would be one of the disciplines that we could offer. What, what topics do you think that could, because I, I think, I know that you are very much concerned about that, uh, even in your abstract, you describe it, how the courses are in the undergraduate, the disciplines are in the undergraduate. So in the graduate, do you have suggestions that we could discuss? Yeah, I can I can think of things that I would really like my students to have the ability to take. Um, so some things that I think are really useful, I definitely think advanced process control, nonlinear systems, um, optimization, like both algorithms and also theory. Um, I think other things that are great, linear dynamic systems, including observability and controllability is, is really great. Um, other things, 
I did have other ones. Oh yeah, I think like some math class that goes over the different math things that I think it would be interesting um, just from the future of PSC perspective, like to open the students to even more than, like I think a lot of times we kind of have decided certain things are of use in PSC and those are kind of the ones that a lot of times we teach at the graduate level, but I think it would be interesting to have like a very comprehensive math class that like maybe even covers things that we haven't necessarily always thought of the uses of yet, like all the different branches. Like for example, I don't really see a lot of teaching about like number theory for just engineers at the graduate level, for example. I mean, maybe there is in another departments, but it would be interesting just to sort of have like a very big review so that then people might start like putting new things together. And beyond math, I feel like there's still another one I had in mind. Oh yeah, I think it would be helpful to have like machine learning and artificial intelligence um, yes. type things as well, since that's such a big, research area for everyone today that I think it would be helpful for students to just be able to take that so that their advisor doesn't have to have them like learn that on the side to know what's going on. Those kind of things. That's what I would think. Yeah. Are those in line with what you're thinking? Oh, yes. You have given so many suggestions because we think that we have around four disciplines that we are going to uh, prepare. And oh, so, wow. as, yes, as you, you have given suggestions in terms of control and optimization in artificial intelligence, we have these three disciplines that we have uh, previously decided that we would discuss. And uh, in terms of math, uh, it is interesting because, uh, of course, that it is, you see, uh, fundamental. In, and then we can discuss how it would be. Yes, uh, Fabio has made a comment here that he said that he is doing it uh, for undergrad. Undergrad. Uh, oh wow! Yes, that's really oh, cool. Yes. Yeah, he I propose doing... that. I propose a project to them to start to do some things like uh, linear regression stuff like this. That's to through my linear algebra course. So it's it's been working. They are doing very good, very good job. In doing like using Keras, TensorFlow, and our stuff, oh, nice. like Python stuff, and we are kind of trying to introduce new things, and they are learn very fast. It's it's very interesting because for me it was very happy to to understand all the stuffs, all like using Keras, to learn how to use TensorFlow, and stuff. For yes. them, it's very fast. I wow, mean, it's a good idea to do it. Oh, interesting. Helen, uh, one more question that I was curious. How do you, um, you see, what differences would you point between a cyber attack, um, the one that you use, it's like a falsifying of measurements uh, or, and other faults in sensors and, and then uh, the theory of uh, fault detection and diagnosis that uh, is already present in fault tolerant control, um, you see, are there special features that should be addressed when you are uh, dealing with cyber attacks? I think a lot of the special features of cyber attacks, um, so some of them are in the way that, so it's different than measurement noise, certainly, um, in that it can be larger than any bound that you would put on noise. In terms of, so certainly you're right that a fault could also be. Um, from, the, from some of the aspects that we've, looked at with regard to things like process design, it would be different in those situations um, in that if you have a fault, a lot of times when we do like HAZOP, we try to make our process design to handle the things that are like a potential events that we think there's some chance of having be there. And then so if someone knows that you haven't designed against something and they find a way to try to make it happen, then maybe they could still cause a hazard like that. Um, and some of the things about, um, so then in terms of like, could we get theoretical guarantees of the same type with the, um, the fault? So that's interesting. So I guess the idea with what you're saying would be if we used our detection methods um, for both attacks as well as for faults, would it matter which was happening? Yes, I guess, um, of, uh, yes. yeah, mm -hmm. I guess that primarily the idea with the detection methods is just that as long as you're, um, yeah, I guess as long as your false measurement, I guess it doesn't really say where it has to come from. It just no. sort of says, as long as it's in this threshold, this is how you can handle it. 
with the guarantees. Yes. So it's it's kind of a the, the theory can can be very generic, broad, and cyber attack could be one of the special um, occurrences that might happen. I I don't know. It's it's interesting. It's it's important. I think that people are concerned about it. And uh, but the the link with the theory of fault detection and diagnosis and fault tolerant control might be a way. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good uh, point. Yeah, yeah. The way I see Mauricio is a fault is uncorrelated with the other one, and the cyber attack might have a correlation uh, among several different events. So I, I studied this in a intelligent. Uh, uh approach and i try to to see if there are any correlations there is any correlation whatsoever any different events so that's what the, and if specifically if you have algorithm control algorithm uh, being uh attacked because you can rack at least the control law for instance that is a very big stuff right yes and you can control constraint you can you can rack and attack any any aspect of the control. So the first thing in, in, in detecting this is what is the origin of this? Because if you, if you just detect that is a internal problem, it's much safer to to deal with uh, this. Yes, but could be a something external of the plant. So that is a cyber attack characteristics. It, it, it's interesting. But because even, the, even the, who is attacking may be more intelligent than the algorithm and do the, destroy this correlation, <laughs> doesn't it? Yes, but it's interesting because one part of the research of Helen deals with the uh, interpretability and responsiveness in control design. But because I think that the, the menacing of a cyber attack is has a, a I don't know if I, were, I chose the right word, but it's more dangerous, I, I would consider, than other thoughts typically that, that typically happen in sensors, so that the response of the operators and the personnel would be, you see, so we uh, have to also deal with these aspects that the, I would think so, that, the, that people would be much more concerned in terms of a cyber attack than a fault, a simple fault that happen typically with sensors. I think some of the things too are kind of from the implementation perspective. Like if I think of being at a plant and then if I think of what would I do, like how would I prevent someone from, how would I prevent there being faults? Like I would probably go through and I would have preventive maintenance procedures. I would probably have historical data that helps me like know how long until I need to replace things. Like, but with a, a cyber attack, it's because it's malicious. I think that um, like people have said, it has the potential to go beyond what like the traditional ways that you might try to handle something like logically, that's only a physical component. And so I think it does make it more um, like you're, what you're saying, Mauricio, like potentially more, um, more scary in that it kind of goes beyond what you would, like your expectations in many ways, if I frame it that way, I guess. Oh, so, um, I am, that they like it very much and and, and you see that uh, um, complimenting you, Helen. And I I do like to, I would like to thank you too very much. So I will um, pass the word to you so that you can finish. And then I will announce the next uh, talk in our series. And, um, but I, you see, I have to thank you many times i will thank you before your final words and then i will thank you again so i will pass the word to you helen please oh well, thank you so much so it was such a great honor for me and a privilege to be able to be here today with with so many great colleagues and yeah i'm just it was such a great experience thank you so much for inviting me really such a pleasure and such an honor thank you helen um so uh, as I said, I will announce so that the audience know uh, the next presentation 
is uh, I had said that he would present, but I had not given the title of the presentation. So the next presenter is Professor Sigurd. Sigurd is co-gestad from NTNU. He is he was also very kind to to you see you see to be with us, and so his presentation is entitled "Nonlinear Input Transformations for Disturbance to Reject the Coupling and Linearization." And so uh, Helen is invited. If you can, uh, it will be uh, an honor again to have you here and attend this conference. So, um, Professor Sigurd is the next one. And Helen, thank you very much thank again. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope you can keep in touch and have other collaborations. All of us, Ajimiru and Professor George. Um, I will pass the word to Ajimiru and to other colleagues that if they can, uh, if they want to say something so that we can end the session, please feel free. Yes, only many thanks to, to Alan to be here with us, sharing his ideas and new ideas to, to work on these areas. It's also very nice to, to, to meet her uh, for the first time, even if I have worked before. <laughs> so it's very nice to, to see you. Yeah. I hope uh, that you can come here in the future and have some work together in Rio in Brazil also. Uh, when this yeah. all, all this thing passes, no? I, I hope uh, very soon. So, um, Thank you. Do continue this nice collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you. That'd be great. Thanks, yes. Helen. Bye, everyone. Uh so thank you, Helen, again. Uh, you see here uh, in the comments, uh, professors from Federal of Bahia, another institution in Brazil, Idalfonso, that he is from Portugal. From, um, wow. From, um, yes, uh, and also, um, you see, you have many comments here that you can see here. So thank you very much. I, I will now end the session. And um, so I hope, hope to see you again. Professor Tiago Vaz from Itajubá, also many people that are saying that they like the presentation very much. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>